Welcome to the Alt Asset Allocation Podcast. Exploring alternative investment opportunities available to the everyday investor. Here's your host, Ben Lakoff. Hello and welcome to the Alt Asset Allocation Podcast. Today's interview is with Robert Jacobson, all about space. In this conversation, we discuss all things space investing. There has been a massive shift of commercialization of space, and there are loads of opportunities in this area. We talk about what investments can be made now to profit from the inevitable shift of the more space presence in our life. From satellite needs to 5G, Internet of Things, autonomous cars, to space debris cleanup, moon stations, asteroid minings, there are a lot of things to get excited about in regards to space. Before you listen, please don't forget to like or subscribe to the podcast or even better, leave a review. There's a lot here and undoubtedly investments in space are going to be huge, but is now the time to start looking. Join this conversation with Robert Jacobson on all things investing in space. Enjoy. Robert, excited to have you on today. Welcome. Thank you so much, Ben. I'm really excited to be here today. Yeah, absolutely. So you were uh, in- introduced by a mutual friend and uh I think I told you before we started, but in prepping for this, I knew very little about investing in space. I understand that it's a a, a big opportunity, but I pretty much went down the rabbit hole on a number of different things. Um, And I mean, this podcast is all about alternative investments and VCs in space. This is uh, right up our alley, that's for sure. So excited to have you on. So I'm I'm really excited to jump into all things space investing uh, and your book. But before we go into that, can you start a little background on you, where you are, how you got into space investing? Yeah, um, it was not a it was not a linear path. Um, in school, I studied music and business. Although I grew up in the shadow of the of the space shuttle, it has a very long shadow. I grew up in in the Tampa, Florida area, the west coast of Florida. Had seen some space shuttle launches. Went to things like I even went to space camp in Alabama as a as I was pretty young. I think it was eleven or something, um, and was very interested in the area. But you know, when uh, high school and college rolled around, this is like the ninety uh, late nineties. I was a little disappointed with what was not happening with NASA. It was just not going fast enough, and it seemed like any route to space was. I'd, I'd probably have to, you know, go and serve in the military. And there were, there were a bunch of things you'd have to do. And it, was, it would be a very slim chance that even then that I would potentially be selected. So I went off really to go do other things and explore other interests. I think I'm just kind of a bit of an exploratory, nat- uh, my nature, I'm an explorer and, uh, and a dreamer and a visionary. And I was actually working in real estate in the mid 2000s and commercial commercial real estate and working as a musician. And I had uh, been tracking what was going on with the X prize. Now the X prize was a competition that was started by Dr. Peter Diamandis. And the first X prize competition was to send a, uh, a human to a privately have a privately funded spacecraft to send a human to space. And I think part of the rules were that they had to, you know, the pilot and the equivalent of, I think one or two passengers get them to the edge of space, which is about 62 miles above sea level or hundred kilometers, return them safely and do that twice within two weeks. So I've been tracking that there were a number of teams. Most of them weren't very not that necessarily they weren't credible. They probably just didn't have the resources. And um, uh, there was a company out of uh, Mojave, California called Scaled Composites. And that was led by Burt Rattan, who had built the Voyager aircraft, which had was the first aircraft to fly unrefueled around the world. He met with Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, with this crazy idea to, to enter the uh, XPRIZE competition. Paul Allen funded it, and they ended up winning. So where do I kind of fit in? So in June 21st, 2004, I was playing a concert at a festival in in downtown Los Angeles underneath, inside the Walt Disney Concert Hall. There's a second theater called Red Cat. And there was this festival, I think it was called Ear Jam. It's no longer around. I think it was called Ear Jam. And it was a Sunday night. So this was, I think, the June 20th. And I'm telling people backstage, I said, hey, later tonight after the show, I'm going to drive out to Mojave and see a 
see a, a private rocket launch. Who wants to go? And most people are like, well, it's a Sunday night. I'm going home. It's late. Why? Well, I got one buddy, uh, my buddy Scott, and we rolled out like, I think 2 a.m., 3 a.m., drove out about 100 miles to the Mojave Airport. Didn't really know what we were getting into. And there were lots of other people up there. It was dark. It was windy. It was kind of cold. But there was a definite energy in the air. And as the morning, as the, as the dawn, you know, came in and they brought out the, uh, there was the White Knight, which was the carrier aircraft that carried the spaceship one. It was real palpable energy. It was just really amazing. And then after seeing it fly to space and return, I felt, tr I felt literally transformed. And I said, I have to be a part of this. This is going to be a catalyst that's going to help change humanity. I don't know how I'm going to be involved. And a number of other things happened. Eventually, I, I transitioned out of co commercial real estate. I started working with a, um, a, a business partner who was working at a real estate fund. I en enrolled him into my kind of crazy dream. And we, we essentially started an investment group kind of early on. In our, and, um, and it wasn't immediately focusing on space or anything like that. But this was sort of the... Um, kind of the, the catalyst for this. And then um, several years later, we ended up investing in, a, in, a, in an aerospace company. And we had an investment in a newspaper in Kern County because we really wanted to get to know, we figured, well, Mojave might be like a little mini Silicon Valley. There's all this um, R&D happening. And what's a better way to understand the area? Let's, let's acquire the local newspaper. Now, this is in the mid 2000s. It wasn't a total bloodbath of the newspapers yet. And we did, um, we, bet, we sold it about 16 months later. Um, but we had a really interesting insight to what was going on in this community. And as I was kind of going back and forth between Los Angeles and uh, Kern County, um, I, I later I kind of realized that Los Angeles has a huge aerospace lineage in history. And I, and I started meeting more people in Los Angeles who are part of um, old, old traditional aerospace and new space in this newer commercial space. And I started making, um, essentially gathering mentors, a network, meeting people, going to a few conferences. There was a lot of self-study. People told me, okay, this is what you need to learn. This is what you don't have to focus on. You're not, if you're not intending to you know, build a rocket yourself. Um, so it was, it was, it was sort of a, a long kind of organic process. I did eventually, many years later, go back to the International Space University where I did some schooling there. Um, before that, I also joined the management team at the Space Angels Network and was there for a number of years. Um, so I, I, I think what space made me realize is I really had this passion for, for startup type of activity, but maybe I didn't really get involved with it in, in, the, in, the, in the late 90s with the, with the um, internet 1.0, not for any particular reason, but I don't think it necessarily as resonated on a, on a on kind of an emotional level as the way kind of space did that. I really felt that space was going to be an area that would truly transform humanity and could be um, uh, the ult humanity's ultimate business plan. Awesome. Awesome. What a great intro. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fascinating. So I haven't had that aha moment uh, with space investing until doing quite a bit of research for this. And it's definitely something I want to jump into more. So your book, Space is Open for Business, is now available. And then, as I told you, I mean, I, I've got this backlog of books, but now I'm super excited to read it. But a lot of what I've read about it is it kind of is broken into a few different parts. So history of the space industry opportunities and then like sneak peeks of, the, the, uh, of where this industry is going. So that's kind of the way I'd like to structure this conversation. And I think um, starting off with a brief history of the space industry might be very beneficial. So, I mean, your space history started with the X Prize in 2004, but you know, what, do, uh, what do investors in this area need to know about the history? Well, so traditionally, it, there's, so people know who like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, who are well-known people who are investing and active in the space industry. And there's been plenty of other wealthy people who could have done these sorts of activities earlier, but they didn't. I had heard actually, and I, uh, that, that the Rockefeller family actually, I think back as, as maybe in the late fifties or early sixties did invest in some type of rocket propulsion company. And I don't know what ever happened to it, but that was, that was kind of interesting, but there are really policies in place by the U.S. government that was not in favor of private 
sector involvement. You really had um, uh, Department of Defense and NASA working with a few hand-selected uh, incumbents. And these incumbents didn't really want a lot of other players because they had very juicy contracts. There was, you know, there's fixed price contracts and cost plus. Many of their contracts were cost plus, meaning that they could kind of take their time. There's not a lot of competition for, uh, you know, uh, people eating away at their contract. So why would they want new, why would they want new entrants to a field? There was just, there was a lack of incentive or accountability, and especially in terms of program, in terms of time of program, you know, having a program that might go for a decade was, was not a big deal without necessarily even showing um, a deliverable. Um, so it was, it was kind of accepted that space was special, it was protected, it's highly regulated. And space also, um, unfortunately, ha you know, there's you know, a lot of risk. So there's, there was kind of a political and, and legal type of risk, regulatory risk, because it was highly regulated. There was um, market risk. So, you know, if you had, say, you're coming up in the 80s or 90s or even early 2000s, you had some crazy idea. And there were some people who had these crazy, seemingly crazy commercial space ideas, but there was no market or no proven market, no track record, and technology risk. Having those three barriers makes it difficult for an investor. So they're like, yeah, let's just let the taxpayer and, and, and government kind of handle it. Now there was exceptions because there is a fairly, there's a robust communication satellite industry where we get, you know, radio, TV, you know, we have these big, large, expensive satellites that sit out thousands of miles away from earth and they're positioned usually in geostationary orbits. They're just facing what they're, they're, they're tracking the earth. So maybe they're facing Europe or Africa or, or North America. And, and those business models are well understood and they're publicly traded companies. But um, so th there had been some of these kind of these dreamers and, and visionaries back in the probably even as far as maybe in the late 70s and 80s and 90s who had wanted to do things differently, but the environment just wasn't right or they had great ideas and they didn't have the resources. But then comes along, you know, where you have people like Richard Branson, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, where they were making money um, in technology, media, and other places. And they were interested in investing in some of the, in actually putting this, some of their capital to, to, uh, to use in some of these other ways. So um, to kind of, uh, to, to bookend that into in, in the early 2000s, you had um, government being a little bit more, starting to be more open to working with these new entrants because some of these new entrants, we're putting a lot of this early capital, it was like they were spending the CapEx themselves or their investors and it wasn't just coming from the US government. So when NASA said, uh, saw that there were some of these new players, NASA said, okay, we don't have the space shuttle anymore. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, we're missing some infrastructure, some transportation infrastructure. And there's only so long that we can rely on the Russians. Because what happened in about, um, was it 2010 or 2011 is that the space shuttle program was retired and NASA had, the U.S. space program had no indigenous domestic way to get humans to space. We could get satellites in our robotic spacecraft or un, uncrewed ones, but we had no way to get humans. And we were relying on Russians and that was necessarily had some of its own challenges. So, we, so NASA started using, putting some contracts out there, first saying, hey, if you can get cargo to the space station, and that was an interesting area, we'll pay for this. And then they, they created a new contract for a crew, which was humans. And SpaceX and Boeing um, were uh, awardees in those, in those contracts. And the benefit and the upside is that the amount of, in, call it an investment, that came from the US government through NASA was much, was, was you know, it, it was not a lot of money few billion dollars and they're getting entirely new dependable forms of transportation infrastructure in much shorter periods of time. So there, um, so there's, there was like this aha movement, like going, wow, this was actually really 
really good money for the for 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 what you know for what NASA spent. And now um, we have this um, new rocket that the uh, that flies regularly that SpaceX has called the Falcon Nine. Flies it's operational. It has a price, and that's an important thing that that space was a very uh, opaque market. You can never really get a price on sending something to space. You can just call NASA and say, hey, I want to send my widget, whatever it is there. It was very difficult to get a price. And now SpaceX started publishing their prices. And just for the fact of having some marking, some pricing transparency has probably given more comfort level for different types of players, actors, whatever terminology you want to use, new entrants to start participating in this area because they at least sort of say, hey, at least we can build a financial model around this. If we at least know if we want to do this activity in space, but we, we at least now know how much it's going to cost to get there. It used to just be a big X. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, no, and I think, I, man, there's a lot there that I want to unpack. I, I, I think, um, you know, thinking about security and things like that, if, if, if it's just totally democratized, you, you can write a check and get to space. Uh, and we'll certainly go down there. But I think you brought up a good point. So privatization really works to advance a lot of these aspects forward more quickly than it would if it were in the hands of the government, which I completely agree with. But then there are other aspects like, uh, you know, deep space colonization of Mars, these things that transcend the lifespan of a typical investor that's willing to foot the bill for a private enterprise to do this. So I think there's a necessary role for government in investments in space just because they have this ability to transcend multiple investor generations and actually fund these things that, you know, zooming out in 200 years, like, is it going to be profitable? Absolutely. But like over the next hundred years, trying to build a colony on Mars or, or, or these deeper space uh, excursions, I mean, there's not really, in, unless you're building the technology for the government to do these things, um, you know, it's very, very difficult to make a profit along the way, I would think, right? Yeah, nobody, I mean, even, um, I mean, like what Elon, I think, has alluded to for his idea of his city on Mars is that people go, well, what is the economic model? What he and a few other people have described is that they believe that there will be IP created. So intellectual property, new inventions, new technology could get created um, that would either facilitate that development on Mars or get created on Mars that will get exported off Mars. That's the thought. We don't really, it sounds plausible, but we don't really know. You would have, you know, no, no one knows. Yeah. It's plausible though, but yeah. Definitely, definitely makes sense. So uh, zooming out and kind of, so, so that kind of helps set the stage of, of privatization and the ability to uh, profit from this expansion, space mm -hmm. investing rather. So jumping into the next uh, kind of segment that I was thinking, um, opportunities. I mean, there's, so there's a lot from asteroid mining to just low orbital satellites. Like what, um, how do you think about all the different opportunities and how does this fit into your like overall thesis on space investing? Well, there's some different verticals that you can look out at spread out horizontally and you can or call them categories for space. You could, um, let's just take real estate was, was my background. Uh, and I initially did spend some time scouting around the Mojave Air and Spaceport. What are the tangible real estate brick and mortar opportunities at a potential spaceport? So you could look at, you could, you know, a real estate investor, someone who knows that area really well could, could look at, at that as a terrestrial market. There's um, communications, uh, and I mean that your satellites that offer communications, satellites require something to talk to on the ground. So there's a ground, they call it a ground segment. Um, there's that area. There's um, on-orbit experimentation, whether you're looking to do new types of manufacturing processes for uh, materials or, or, or biological experiments. There's that area. They're sending humans to space. There's that in-between area of entertainment, whether you're bringing, you know, VR content or like video and VR content from space or creating space themed entertainment for people here on earth or actually physically getting humans into space. There's habitats. Um, 
there's resource extraction, which would be asteroids, other celestial bodies like the moon. Um, there's even potential energy plays. That's probably further out where, you know, generating energy in space, probably initially for in space utilization. It, it gets pretty, um, it's debatable on, on how, on, there, and there's some who are big advocates on, on sending energy from space back to Earth. Um, that's, uh, we don't have to go into that too much right now. Um, I'm particular. I, I think where it's, it's going right now is this industrialization of this lower Earth orbit, and that's the kind of the altitude that's about kind of about to where the space station is. It's a few hundred miles out, and that's where that's a lot of the low hanging economic fruit. You have people building new types of satellites. They're usually smaller, and then putting them in greater numbers. They're providing some type of data services, whether it's uh, potentially internet, commercial weather. Uh, other analytics or putting telescopes on them basically so they can do uh, imaging of um, for variety of reasons I think that's that's kind of the right what's happening right now and then you're going to see that envelope expand and then I think the moon which is about a quarter of a million miles away is probably um, th there is some traction there because there's just it seems like government different governments around the world are, are, are putting energy back to the moon, there's private resources going back to the moon. So I think the moon will, it, the moon will be both a place to stay long-term and a training ground for other long-term missions. Since it's, you can get there in two to three days, there's a lot of reasons why we should do some, um, there's useful resources there, we can, we can learn. So I, I see it as being kind of a training ground, you know, where we can have a long-term presence and, and just test out things because Mars is, I mean, any other planet, whether it's going to Venus or Mars, is, is, is substantial. There's a lot of things that we still don't know about uh, long-term uh, for humans. We, there's still a lot we don't know for, for humans to thrive on, on, on a long-term journey. Um, even though we've had you know, astronauts stay in space for like over a year, but they're close to Earth, they're on a space station, there's just other, there's other variables that aren't accounted for. Yeah, definitely. Um, man, all these conversations, like the, uh, the, the jumping off point on uh, the moon and mining for water to use as propellant for these things, like definitely want to get into that. I'm curious, how, how do you think, so as an investor, I mean, every investment is an opportunity cost into another one. Um, so in terms of timing, it sounds like industrialization of lower Earth orbit is like the next thing right? And does this tie into 5G and IoT and the need for more better imaging with autonomous vehicles? Like what is driving the industrialization of this lower Earth orbit and how do investors play it? I, I don't see this being kind of sequential, like it's um, because there's this interest in 5G, that's why they're building satellites or vice versa. But I do think it's, it's an ecosystem. Because so as I shared, we've had satellites for a long time that have done a lot of these activities. They were high performance and very expensive. But what we've seen is, is there's a, a few, few facets. W one is that electronic miniaturization. So just as like, you know, I got my, my phone here, it's, you know, and it keeps getting more powerful each year if I choose to upgrade, and it's practically a disposable, disposable satellite technology is coming the same way. Now, people are still spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on satellites up to many millions but they but you're getting a lot of and some of these smaller satellites you're getting a lot of bang for the buck and it's getting less expensive to get to space so that's helpful and it's getting more predictable it used to just be where you didn't really know when you could get to space so now you could you can go to a third party service and they can help you if you need to get to space q3 2021 they can probably help make it happen. So there's this uh, transparency in pricing, um, scheduling and getting your, your, let's just say your satellite to space. And then also in parallel on the ground, we have these other industries like IOT, you have self-driving cars, just general automation and efficiency, you know, just generally technology is pushing for, for, for efficiency and optimization in every anything. Like not, there's nothing safe. Like it's, there's nothing sacred. There's no area that's undiscovered. And um, groups have started to look and say, hey, are there some gaps that maybe we need to fill out? You know, 
uh, you know, can we use a drone for, like, let's take internet access. There's still billions of people without any internet access. And there's all sorts of projects using high altitude balloons, using drones, um, building expensive fiber optic, you know, laying in fiber optic into new roads in developing countries. Um, and satellite, there have been, they had tried using in the past satellites, but it was expensive and difficult, but because the price is coming down, there's now new efforts. There's like six different major companies from Apple to Amazon and um, OneWeb and SpaceX that all have um, their different flavors, but essentially doing, providing internet access using smaller satellites. And they're, they're, a lot of those plays are around providing broadband, higher speed services to consumers. It's a B to C business, although with a big CapEx. There's also groups out there um, like Skylo, which is a, it's a startup. They just closed, to, I think, a hundred million dollar. I think their Series A was a hundred million. Maybe their Series B, a hundred million. SoftBank was one of the partners, um, and they are using. Um, they're actually using. They're taking existing existing satellites and doing what narrowband to provide um, small packets of data to things like agricultural customers for IOT. So now you also have, it's like take example, in the agricultural market, they're trying, you know, they're trying to optimize their yield and use less water, use less fertilizer for economic and environmental reasons. And they're trying to, um, maybe they have large plots of land, they're trying to get all these different, the equipments and the sensors in the field to talk to each other. And satellites are just kind of like another place on the, it's just like, it's like having a, it's like another hub. Um, and um, there's, there's uh, and I've, from what my limited knowledge around self-driving cars is that there's still places that have like these gaps in cell and, and satellite. And they think that satellite could be a place that I'll be like, it, it's not gonna be complete, the car won't be completely reliant on the satellite. It'll be like a, it's just like, it's just an extra checkbox to give it more dependability, you know, when it's in um, a, a remote area. Um, so there's probably not an industry yet where space doesn't touch. And many times it's just not well, well known, but, um, but I think we'll just find more, we'll continue to find more and more use cases. Yeah, yeah, and I agree. So, I mean, all the tech improvements here are moving towards more satellites. We just need more of them. We need more visibility, all of this data and information. And then you have that part paired with miniaturization, the ease and lower cost of sending these things up. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, more satellites, that makes sense. I get it. But then uh, something that I read about that, that terrified the crap out of me is something called Kessler syndrome. So yes. the Kessler syndrome is, is a theory that was uh, proposed by a NASA scientist in 1978, that these satellites just bang into each other and create debris. And then this debris keeps banging into other satellites until it's just a debris cloud that surrounds the US or surrounds the world rather. <laughs> We're the center of the world, too. You know, no, it surrounds the world, this uh, cloud of debris. So we can never leave or come back because we're surrounded by this debris cloud. So I start thinking about something like that. And then, you know, the uh, space debris is, is a big issue already. And if more and more satellites are coming up, then you know, thinking through the second order effect, maybe it's maybe instead of investing in the satellite companies, which is an obvious play, maybe you start thinking about these debris cleanup companies that are going up there developing the AI necessary to say, this is a piece of debris, vaporize it. This is a, this is not, or, you know, China's uh, technology in 2007 when they blasted a satellite out of, out of orbit. I mean, um, so what a, which created a ton of debris by the way, but um, you know, is, is that something you're thinking about when investing in space as well? Yeah. So I, I met, I've met organizations, um, there's a company, um, there's a few of these companies that had started saying, hey, we want to clean up um, orbital debris. And it sounds great. And uh, you're like, I love the mission, love the idea. But the problem has been is there's nobody wants to pay for it yet. And you'll find that a few of, the, a few of these companies have all pivoted and they're changing. They're going to now instead of 
debris mitigation to debris tracking, or um, they want to be like a towing service to tow a satellite to somewhere else, which is great. It's useful and there's customers for it. But we, we as a society or, or nation states have not necessarily, they've not, they have regulations in terms of like how you're a good actor with your satellite. You know, usually when you have like one of these big, large communication satellites, they've got, they've got propulsion. They're usually assigned a graveyard or when they get to the end of their life, they move to a graveyard orbit. They're far away from earth. There's not a problem. And in, in, in some of the technology, now uh, we're looking at refueling these satellites to be able to extend their life and make them so they can still generate revenue for longer. And that's great too. But now we have all these smaller satellites that are near earth that could potentially collide each other. Well, when they put, they're not just putting them up anywhere. They are trying to put them up in a place where it's not going to collide, but there's now just so many, call it debris, you would have this increased possibility of this, you know, call this. Kepler's potential Kepler syndrome. So a couple things can happen. One is that these satellite, the small, the, these smaller satellites that are in lower Earth orbit, do decay. They they're always falling, and eventually they will burn up. Now, hopefully, they don't hit in, on their on their way back into Earth. They don't hit anything else. But the idea is that they will they will decay. They will burn up. No problem. Some of these smaller satellites are ha are, are being included with propulsion so that you can maneuver them. And there's even discussion of whether that's going to be a requirement for all these small satellites. I don't know what, what, what that answer is because there's, I mean, there's, there's groups that are looking at putting up satellites that are like smaller than your hand. Think about like, there's a group called ThumbSat. They want to make like these little, almost microchip size um, satellites. But if it's still moving at 17,000-ish miles per hour, it's still potentially dangerous. Absolutely. I mean, there was a piece of paint that punctured triple bulletproof glass or whatever. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it's terrifying how fast these things go and the destruction that they can do. Yeah, so I, I, I think um, we're gonna eventually, see, unfortunately humans are not great at being proactive. I imagine some, something in the space environment will have to get a little worse until we decide to do something a little more proactively or create economic incentives for the private sector to create businesses around. I don't know whether it's like a tax that's buried into some type of bill, you know, it's like a cellular phone tax is a little one penny for orbital debris cleanup. Um, so there's no shortage of ideas in very early stage technology to, to deal with it, but there's not been a, um, an economic model yet. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, just curious, like, Regulatory, you said regulatory risk, obviously, but like, I, I mean, there are strict regulations on to who can send up what, and you have to get a, you have to get a pass from people. Like, how does this work? Can I create a satellite and go launch it off? From so if you, you, you can <laughs> buy a satellite off the internet um, or a kit, and you can do it for even a few thousand, get a kit for in the thousands, put it together what? yourself. Yeah, yeah, it's not that, ex it's really getting not that expensive. I mean, more, you know, ten, tens of thousands of dollars probably for like a kit. From from beginning to end to uh, I have my own satellite orbiting the Earth? No, you still have to pay for launch and some licensing things. So, oh, yeah, all that what, so what you got to do, so say you, you there's there's kits. You can build your, your, your satellite and you maybe whatever sensor you have on it, you can lots of upgrades, lots of ways to upsell you on things you want. But then you have to find, you have to get... Um, you have to pay to get it launched to space. And then if your satellite is going to talk to the ground to make it you know, useful, you're going to have to um, get a license. And um, so there's, and that's with like, if it was in the US, the FCC, um, and they cover that. And so there are, um, there's a few bureaucratic, but they're not insurmountable, but there are third party services that could help someone who basically to hand hold them or do it for them. And there's even groups that like, I think as young as like elementary schools that have sent satellites to space. And there are groups that have helped facilitate that. So you have literally elementary age students through high school and university sending satellites to space. And that's in part of it because the, it's just the, the, the parts are cheaper. The whole, the whole, the whole value chain is just getting less expensive and e easier to easier to navigate. 
Man, school is so much cooler now than what I remember. I mean, the kids are meditating in class. They're shooting up satellites. Like, we had recess and we, like, I think I adopted a star at one point or something. You, like, pay $5 to some organization. You get to name a star. Who knows what I even named it? <laughs> okay. So, um, before we jump on to a next one, so satellites for the everyday investor. I mean, is this something you pick a few private companies that are investing in it? How do you how do you okay, think so, through this? I mean, one way, if you're just a kind of a main street way to 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 easily sample, there's a few ETFs that people can buy into where electronically traded funds where, and they're, they're basically holding companies you're familiar with, large contractors, maybe some communications companies, some launch companies, but that's maybe a way to, to just super inexpensively just kind of see like how things are kind of trading. You know, they, they've got, I mean, it's company like Boeing, Harris, is Harris Corporation public, I forget, but they're like communications company and, and doing government work. Um, and then you've got, um, now you've got um, private companies that, um, you know, it's falling under purely under alternative investments where some of these companies are at the level where it's really early stage technology where you could put in a few thousand bucks, but it is highly risky. It's it, like, it maybe it's a very low TRL level. So in this, it's not just purely in the space industry, but there's this term called technology readiness level. I think it's on a one through 10. And it goes from like a very basic technology that's like still in the lab all the way through something that's maybe commercialized. So there are ways to invest um, at the low TRL level, highly risky, but you're, you're, you're essentially helping an inventor along and saying, okay, this is just like, I'm gonna assume I'm losing this money. Um, to companies that now have very uh, uh, well-developed business plans, well-developed teams, and they can be invested in directly through syndicates, through angel groups, or um, you can invest as a limited partner into venture capital funds that might allocate a portion of, uh, or that are looking at space or, or completely, or now we have venture funds that are, that are attempting to be t solely focused on the space sector. Um, so it really, really varies. And I think because space is its own ecosystem, it's not just one thing. And they just, I think the investor needs to get out of thinking it's just rockets or satellites. There's all this other enabling activity going on. Think about something that either resonates with you personally or professionally. Let's just say you own, you're involved with insurance products. Well, there are um, insurance related space efforts there, you know, rockets get insured, satellites can be insured. There's insurance companies, Climate Corp, Climate Corporation that Monsanto bought for a little under a billion dollars. And they were using satellite data to, to, and they were selling insurance products or they are in selling insurance products to farmers. And Monsanto realized this was pretty valuable and they acquired it for about a billion dollars. It was a private company based in North California. Um, so you could, so so an investor if they have a um, you know a forte and expertise in an area, whatever that is, do a little researching and see where does that what is space? How is it leveraging it? Is there a way that space enables that sector? That would be way I might kind of do it. Just using my own, and then you can get you know you can go completely do a tangent and say oh okay what's going on and like, is anybody doing sports in space or sports and, you know, mashing up sport. You know, I remember hearing a pitch from a guy who was trying to create a, a sports league using parabolic aircraft using, uh, you basically get like 20 seconds of zero microgravity and creating sports. But what was funny was the entrepreneur wasn't really pa that passionate about sports and it was pretty expensive to fly these planes to do it. And I don't think that um, I, I don't think that went very far. <laughs> I love it. I love it. But no, I think these, that, I think this that's is the type good. of thinking. You know, you yeah. have to you have to sometimes space takes you know doing a lot of your own research and reading um, and doing some of your own thought exercise because you don't see right now a lot of um, typical like you know for people investing in kind of alternative assets, say in like companies 
they're thinking about maybe IPOs. And there's not a lot of IPOs in the space sector today, industrial public offerings. But what you do have is more M&A activity. You have companies acquiring other companies in, in this type of activity. And I expect you will continue to see that. And another area that we, it's happening and we'll see more of is probably these SPACs. Um, what are they, the special purpose? Special purpose acquisition. acquisition. Companies, yeah. whatever the C is. Yeah, so, so Virgin Galactic went public through through a, a SPAC. There's a, a company um, called Momentus, which is a, a private new space company that will be going public through a SPAC in 2021. So, you know, there so there's these you know there are these examples, and there'll be you know every investor has to like do their due diligence on this, and it's. And it's not easy. More people have lost money in, in the space sector that have made money. It is, it is still rare to make money to 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 make to make money as an investor. You, it's possible, and I still believe in that. There's there are we're now at a time where there's better business models, but it's yeah. still a difficult road. It's it's sort of like the early days of the internet where. Um, there was a lot of money flowing around, but not a lot of people were making money at the internet. I, I think yeah. we're smarter now. We have the benefit of experience. It's it's like it's like uh, the pioneers or the the first Europeans who were coming to the, the Americas. They didn't really know what they were getting into. We know more about Mars, even though we haven't had humans go to Mars yet. We will know more about Mars because we have these robots on Mars and, and, and other exploration. So we just have all this benefit of this technology that gives us insight. And as an investor, we have almost too much data that we can, we can glean from. So I would suggest to, to, uh, you know, to investor, find what resonates, pick a few things and just go there. It's easy to get over, overwhelmed by the, the number of choices. Oh yeah, well, I mean, being early and right sometimes actually is very wrong with from an investment perspective. I've so been I, there. I, I, I've been there. So I've been there. I know. <laughs> I, I know. I know the pain. Right. I know the. I know the pain. So. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. So I, 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 this perhaps a good segue into uh, let's let's jump right into the moon. So I mean that was another one of the opportunities that you had talked about. I've read a bunch of wild stuff on it. Uh, it just at, at first glance it seems crazy to me that something that happened you know, we landed on the moon and we beat the Russians and it was like, tick that box. And, and now all of a sudden there's this re renewed interest in it uh, for a number of reasons. So perhaps a touch on those reasons and why, why something like the moon gets you excited. Yeah. So the moon has actually been of interest to, um, even for governments for a long time, before we had the Apollo mission, the U.S. Air Force had a plan, I think it was in the late 50, 1950s, to put a base, a, a human crewed base on the moon. And there's papers that are available out there. To, you, can, you can read about this. Um, the moon, you know, so, so space is a strategic high ground. You're literally at an altitude where you can see the Earth and get a great vantage point. And that's, and, and in early on during the, the Cold War days, um, you know, we were flying airplanes and we were flying balloons and trying to look at what the uh, our adver adversaries were doing. And satellites were thought to be useful. They, they were worried about either them being delivered to, to deliver nuclear devices as a weapon, but initially just to see what the other side was doing, putting cameras on them. It was just a really, it had a, um, you know, it was potentially you could your airplane could be shot down a little more difficult to shoot down your satellite but then if you go a few hundred thousand miles out to the moon and imagine if you had an observatory on the moon you cannot just see what's going on in like a uh, maybe say a small field of the earth if you're close to earth you could see what's going on on a much larger area so there's really um from a, a strategic vantage point when you're at the moon you can see you you're looking at the whole earth. So you get that. Then you also have the materials there. It's been, the moon has been being pounded by uh, meteorites for millions of years. And a lot of those meteorites, some of them that are, that are near the surface, have potentially useful materials that we could use to make other things on the moon or use 
in space for manufacturing in space. And at the, um, at the poles, there is water ice, which could be useful. That water could be you know, used for fuel or for drinking water, for oxygen for crew. So that's, that's very useful. And more recently, they found that maybe there's, well, it looks like there's water in other parts of the moon. We're not really sure how much of it is and how useful the water that's spread around the moon. And, and I'm sure we'll find ways to, to, to utilize it. Um, but there's activities, I, I, I think we'll start seeing, manu like again, the, the moon will be like a, a jumping off point. Manu you know, maybe some manufacturing, some, um, some research, um, you know, kind of a, a gateway destination going to other parts of the solar system. I mean, who knows, maybe in the far future, it might be a good retirement place. You're like, okay, one six, one six gravity, easy on the bones for an older person, you know, great view of the moon, you know, great view of the earth, you know, and, and the solar system, you know, maybe you'll have um, uh, entertainment complexes, who knows, one day being stood up there, you know, new types of sports and low uh, um, gravity. I've, I'm launching, um, I'm on, I'm on I, uh, a co-founder on a startup that we're launching this fall to uh, help democratize the sort of space experience and we're bringing our, our goal in 2021 is to bring a million people to the moon through their legacies and we're doing that using some uh, uh, mission testing technology through a nonprofit i work with it was called arc mission foundation and we had a um we had payload on the israeli spacecraft that um, went to the moon the beret sheet um, and we're using the same uh, technology where we're going to be able to take about a million people's legacy uh, uh, through their stories, their dreams, their photographs, and etch that onto a nickel disc. And this disc is only about 100 grams. It's really small, but it's etched into analog and can be read without a computer, just with a microscope. And that'll be taken on a commercial provider in 2021 to the moon. So we're, um, and this will just be something that people will be able to sign up for on a, on a website and, and, and have, you know, a, a piece of them um, go to the moon. So Ooh, there's a really range of, like of, of activities and, and, and I think things that are, will, will have different types of economic value yeah. through leveraging the moon. So, I, I mean, this begs the question of like geopolitical risk. I mean, this really seems like some game theoretical situation, some sort of nuclear arms race V2 of like, I, I mean, can, can this exist, uh, especially like in this deglobalization kind of trend that it seems to be happening? Can this sort of advancement and putting a putting a space station on the moon can this happen without uh, collaboration amongst a number of key countries uh it can it 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 is allowed to happen so a country can unilaterally go to the moon and utilize the resources of the moon it gets tricky when if you say if that entity, whether it's a nation state or a corporation or an individual says, I want to own this area of the moon. You can't really do that, but you, but you can utilize the resources. You can go there and take all the resources if you exactly. can figure out how so, to get them off. Wow. Exactly. But I know like the United States has, has created this thing called the Artemis Accords where they're trying to, um, they're getting, they're attempting to get other nation states to sign on to sort of say, we're going to, um, behave in a, in a particular way under certain guidelines and rules and norms on the moon. But they're having difficulty, I think, getting, like, I don't think China hasn't signed on, or I don't know if they've invited China or Russia to sign that. So we could still see a lot of bifurcation of, you know, um, and I don't want to describe as good or bad or positive or negative, but we will see different nation states will have different viewpoints on how to do things. I think what is clear is that some of the um, uh, historical activity, whether it's Chinese landers, the Apollo missions, those areas, I think it's, it's being understood that like, that, that th that's kind of like hollowed ground that nobody's gonna um, go mess up, you know, nobody's gonna go land next door and 
go kick the, 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 the astronaut footprints. How that gets um, enforced will be TBD. Um, Space Force. Yeah, but I <laughs> do think you're going to see several different nation states that will put forth their own ideas on how to operate. Um, but I do know there, there is definitely a growing interest by in U.S. policy about concern about China in the moon. Um, that um, whether it's warranted or not, and maybe the Chinese feel the same way about us. So as, as Americans, so I, I just think that would caution and ask people to start thinking of themselves as not just a citizen of their country or multiple countries if they have multiple passports or citizen of the earth, but start thinking of ourselves as a citizen of the solar system. And that's difficult to think about, but we really are going to start, we, we really need to, I think, impress upon ourselves and our children and our grandchildren that we are members and citizens of this bigger neighborhood and that we should use it wisely because like earth, the resources of the solar system are not unlimited. They are limited. There's only so much of the moon, but if we use the resources of the solar system in a smart way, thinking more long-term rather than short-term, we will have plenty for many generations. And, and, and where this will help us is when we're ready as a species, or, or if we evolve to other species, to leave the solar system, we need to be able to have the right amount of resource so that we can, that we can, we can go and be interstellar. Um, and, I, and I know that's really difficult for us when we can barely think about what's going on next week. <laughs> well, this is a, a, a very pervasive uh, issue with society as, as it is, right? Short-termism. Right now we're recording this on November 4th and like it's amidst the, amidst the uh, U.S. presidential elections. And it's the whole world stops every four years for a couple days yeah. while this is happening. And it's like... Are we focusing on the important long-term things? And and actually on that topic, just to talk comment, the U.S. has very good reason to be worried about China uh, because they are very good long-term strategic thinkers. And if the moon creates some sort of strategic advantage for the long, long term, you better believe that they're thinking about it and thinking very, very hard about yeah. it. Yeah, there's a movie I recommend people see if they've not seen it called The Wandering Earth. It's uh, one of the short stories based on a popular, very popular science fiction author in China. Um, and it's now available on, I think it's streaming on Netflix. And it's kind of a preposterous, uh, the, 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 the synopsis is that several hundred years in the future, our sun is going supernova. Well, we want to survive. What are we going to do? We're going to move the earth out of the solar system. <laughs> to a new star <laughs> and China's helps lead the way. And they literally put a ring of engines around the planet without giving too much more. It's a bit of a mashup of Armageddon and several other films. It's fun and kind of ridiculous, but the film had some investment from the Chinese government and it, there is propaganda in the film and there's several messages in the film. And, and one of the key messages is that um, China is, is a spacefaring nation thinks long term and is going to space. So if anybody is interested in and in, in, in this is an it's a it's a fun action science it's action meets science fiction but encapsulates some of these things like what China's interested in, go see this film. I like it and I'll definitely link that in the show notes. I haven't seen it yet so looking forward to that as well. Uh perhaps a good segue. So another long-term thinking, something that's totally unfeasible now, space mining, and I'll also link the Bloomberg quick take uh, from YouTube that I went down the rabbit hole, but it's about 27 minutes. So a few stats that I took from this. Asteroid Psyche 16, NASA's launching of 2022 probe, uh, and it is, <laughs> it's 95% metals, and some have estimated its value at 700 quadrillion dollars which doesn't even make sense, right? Um, or the Davida asteroid, which is valued at over a hundred trillion dollars with platinum, gold, iron, rare earth materials. So the economic incentive to figure out asteroid mining, even though, even if you mine it correctly, like you probably can't bring it back to the US. Um, so that the, 
the Japanese one in uh, in 2010, the total cost to just bring back a little bit of dust was about $250 million. So you need to bring back, you need to figure out those economics before it can make any sense. But I mean, what are your thoughts on asteroid mining? I, I used to totally dismiss this as something insane, but. Apparently there, there are some asteroids that are a lot closer than we think they're not all just as far away people imagine or as they, they seem to show the expanse. So there are some close ones. I think it will happen. It's just a matter of time. I think this is my personal sense is that what we learn in lower earth orbit in terms of automating things and robotics will be very useful because it's going to be, it's a dangerous activity. Why put humans there? Use robots. The moon will be very informative and that's happening, this, this technology. What I still don't understand is, so say you have this, whatever quadrillion, this, this, this rock in space as metal fell at quadrillions. <laughs> if we could extract some fraction of it, and it'll probably be most useful for in space things because we're probably, it's gonna be too difficult to bring maybe platinum metals or other metals off earth into space. So it's sort of like, it's, it's gonna be like our tool, but it's, it's gonna be our mine in space for using active, for doing activities there. What I still don't understand is if and when we're able to bring back some of these resources to earth, does that just depress the pricing of the markets because you have more of it? But maybe that's a good thing because, you know, at one period of time, cellular phones were very expensive. You know, they were only in car, they were bolted in cars. It was the, the per minute cost was, was several dollars. But if you eventually have where, you know, platinum is, you know, is, is so abundant and so ubiquitous, you can do all these other, create all these ap other applications with it. Maybe that does get interesting. And, and an area I would, hope we can maybe we can we can sort of spearhead before this becomes an issue and make it is um sea seafloor mining there's discussion about um uh, mining the seafloor for metals that are there it's still difficult in like you know you're dealing with pressure under and and at least you don't have in space you're not having to deal with that issue it, there's maybe more temperature issues you're, you're you're dealing with it would be great to see us say, hey, you know what, let's not strip mine the seafloor and instead focus some energy on using space resources. And if you go to some of the people like um, Jeff Bezos, his long-term vision is, you know, taking our dirtier, more toxic activities on the earth and taking them into space. So I think that would probably be more in line in saying, wh why do we need to just go strip mine the, the bottom of the ocean floor? We, every time humanity thinks, oh, there's nothing there, it's barren, there's no, like, we're probably gonna find out that it's something is really important to the ecosystem. Maybe there's whale carcasses that are falling that we, we, de we now know that capture carbon. And maybe there are food resources for who knows what that's, maybe a really important part of our ecosystem. We make too many assumptions about, I think about how our own um, earth ecosystem works. So I would hope that we can tread cautiously in terms of um, into this law of diminishing returns on how we're uh, extracting uh, resources on earth, whether it's um, you know, fracking and shale rock for oil or, or metals from the bottom of the ocean. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and there's actually a term for that in, in situ resource utilization. Uh, in situ, so yeah, resource, they sometimes call it in, in situ. situ, like, like in situation. Yeah, I don't know so how they to say it. <laughs> yeah, it's basically saying in situ resources, like using the resources in an environment. So if you say, they'll sometimes say lun lunar, in situ lunar or lunar, which is like on the moon or, yeah. you know, you, using the, re it's like, you know, using the resources where you're at. So use the resource, if you're in space, use those resources. Right. So like you said, I mean, it becomes a toolbox where you go up there and you mine, um, you mine a bunch of platinum that is super abundant in this asteroid. And then you repair your or use it as fuel somehow for the next rocket. I don't know, something like that, which is crazy. So th there is a lot going on with space investing. I mean, what what gets you most excited? There, there, there's so many moving parts. What, what really gets you so excited um, about this? Well, there, um, I, I like looking for some of the areas that are a little bit blue water, you know, a little bit undiscovered. So I'm not necessarily going to 
be all of my, but, but I would say that there are areas that, you know, I think launch is probably becoming less of an issue. There's like over a hundred launch companies. I don't think most of them are going to survive because it's an issue that's becoming solved. I think the areas that's interesting is, you know, how are we going to make humans thrive in space, psychological health, their health and well-being like how do we get people because right now we're kind of camping up in space but how do we get people so you know they don't need as much training they can um we can deal with some of the bone bone loss issues and i think as we we understand that we might find some um maybe therapies for for things and treatments for things on earth i think that's really kind of you know health and wellness is i think interesting i think we might come across new ways to make, manufacture and create new materials is of interest. I really want ubiquitous VR from space where I can like, whether I just put on a big screen or a headset and I can just see some really high resolution, beautiful things and like kind of like meditate there. There's a company I'm working with called Space VR. And uh, so full disclosure, I am working with them, but they, they're doing, they initially wanted to put VR cameras on the space station. And I, I don't quite know why they pivoted, but they did. And what they're doing now, and they got this, they got this, um, this pivot idea from a retired astronaut who said one of the closest activities um, that you could experience on earth to feeling space was going into a flotation tank. They're taking virtual reality and flotation tanks bam, putting them together. So they're getting high res video data from satellites. They've created a, the world's first waterproof VR headset. They have a location in Los Angeles, which I know where you're at. They're already operational. So you go into flotation tank. So you get the feeling of being, um, and, 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 if, and if you don't know what a flotation tank is for those listening, they put several hundred pounds of salt. They heat the water just to about body temperature. And after a few minutes of settling in, you, you, you stop feeling the water and it feels like you're floating. And having this, um, this virtual reality headset on, you're looking at Earth and you get this simulated uh, overview effect experience. So you could see the Earth without looking at borders from space. So instead of spending tens of millions of dollars to go to space, oh you could gosh. spend a hundred bucks to, to feel that. You I gotta send me a link to that afterwards. I mean, well, well, there's a there's a one flotation to tanks are amazing. But they're also called sensory deprivation sensory tanks deprivation. because you have nothing around you and it's it's a really wild feeling. But um, uh, what's the impact? Or what's the effect called when you like realize how big the world the is? The overview tiny... effect. So that the was coined by effect. by author Frank White and and he had he had been talking to a number of astronauts and they had this cognitive shift in their experience of after being in space. Sometimes it was in space, seeing the earth with no borders. And many times that effect lasted when they came back to earth, just like they wanted to treat people, the earth better. They, they just realized that like, Oh man, what, that's, what a, a, that's amazing. I mean, it's a real thing, right? You go out yeah. at night and you stargaze and you realize how all of this, this overview effect is, is quite, strong so i can't imagine you got to send me a link to that yeah yeah so i think there's some neat things i mean entertain entertainment's probably i don't know what the word is it's not edutainment it's not entertainment it's an experience that space entertainment space entertainment but but i think there's some really (laughs) cool things that will develop because we have all this great stuff going on with ar vr and space is just such a cool medium and i think I would love to see kind of more, it's not science fiction, but maybe more things taking the domain of space and then creating new content pieces that are positive and uplifting and not necessarily just cynical and, and dystopian, which many times is kind of the, the easy default on, on like science fiction. So I think that's a kind of a near term uh, opportunity. Um, I, I think the moon is going to have some really valuable ones, but it's, it's, it's still expensive. It's about a million. Don't it's, it's close to not maybe an exact number, but about a million dollars per kilogram to get something on the moon. This is what companies are quoting a little less, a little more. So if you think you're like, you're like, well, I want to take my whatever. And you realize you do the math. You're like, oh my God, just to land it on the moon is going to be like, hundred million dollars and that's not even with like building whatever you can build so 
there, there is right now, I think for Moon, you still have to think kind of small and nimble and um, uh, they're going to be putting a, a, a cellular network. I think it's a 4G network on the moon. That's so there's going to be some communications. I think we need to think about how we're going to power, you know, I have a feeling that that nuclear that using some type of nuclear energy is going to be um, will come into favor um, because uh, the moon has long days but also has long nights. So if you're in darkness for for weeks, you got to have a way to power things. Interesting. Um, all right, just being aware of time, I think yeah. we could talk about these things forever. But I, I mean, there are so many ways of of different playing this to play this. This, this inevitable shift to space as a bigger part of our lives, right? So for somebody like you that lives and breathes and wrote a book on space investing, I mean, clearly an expert within this space, if you had to only choose three, like three, this is where I have to put my money in these sectors and you don't have to name certain companies, obviously, but like with the best, your best bets for profiting on this expansion into space over the next 10 years, because, you know, looking out 200 years, it's very different, right? But like over the next 10 years, like what three areas would you focus most on? Oh, I, God, I'm going to keep it kind of broad. I'm going to say bio life science data and analytics, which communications kind of fits in there too, but I'll say data analytics. And, and, um, I, and I think something about energy, you know, energy now granted, because I think there, I, I think that we still need in space, there's going to be like uh, a big need for, you need, you need to power things in space. And that's still, we kind of do things with solar batteries. Um, like on Mars, they use these, these basically nuclear heating units. And, and I don't think we have kind of like, there's no, there's no commercial Duracell. If you want to think about it like that, nobody has come up with like the EverReady or Duracell for um, that's like very commonplace. Or if you want to go into like Elon Musk parlance, like the Tesla power banks or power walls in this, um, and I think we, you know, investors could start looking at things like that, like what's going to be powering, you know, powering this. Because right now, like satellites, they use, can use solar and that's fine. But when you start thinking about bigger applications, you know, you, you have to, to, to um, think about other things that are going to uh, scale out. Awesome. Awesome. Good stuff. Well, Robert, I loved having you on. Love this conversation. Like I said, I mean, this is something we could talk about for hours. You're incredibly knowledgeable about it. So really appreciate you taking the time. Before we cut off, I mean, where can my listeners find out more about you, about your book? I'll link all of these things in the show notes, but uh, where would you like to send them? Yeah, so uh, the book website, if, and thank you, Ben, uh, the book website is spacesopenforbusiness.com. Have all sorts of ways, it's some free things. People don't even want to buy the book. They can sign up and get some, start getting some information there. Um, we also have some amazing book bonuses there that, uh, that, uh, I, that people can check out that, I, that I'm using to, to share about the diversity and breadth of, of, of space experiences and products. Um, on social media, I'm Robert C. Jacobson. They can usually find me on Twitter at 62 Mile Club, which is an, uh, um, which is a nod to the uh, Carmen line, which is the edge of space, which is 62 miles above sea level. Awesome, awesome. And I'll link all of those, 62 Mile Club. I love it. Robert, really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on today. Thank you very much, Ben. It was wonderful uh, speaking to you. There you go. First off, thank you very much for listening all the way through. I hope you got a lot of value out of that conversation. As always, you can find show notes, links, and more at altassetallocation.com. Please share this with anyone you think might be interested and derive any value from this conversation. And as always, you can reach out to me for any feedback or questions. Please give the video a like, or even better, subscribe on YouTube or your podcast player of choice. This really helps others find the podcast or the video as well. Thanks a lot. Hope everybody has a fantastic day and stay safe out there and invest wisely. Cheers.